Hello, and welcome to Politics and Prose. Um, I'm Alan Watke, the Deputy Director of Events here, um, where we now are back to in-person events. We're also um, doing our larger partnered events um, and supported events, and then we also have trips and classes. And so for everything confirmed, you can go to our website, politics-prose.com. We also have some great looking um, printed event flyers that you can find around the store. So look for those to see what's coming up. Before we get going, I want you all to take out your phones and put it on silent. All right, so you don't disrupt the event. And then um, when we get to the audience portion of this, there's a m microphone right here next to this pillar. Um, it's kind of hidden for some of you, but please come up to the microphone and speak into it. We are filming this, um, and it's going to be on our Politics and Prose YouTube channel, so we want to get your get your question captured in that. Um, and then we, when we get to the time for the signing, it's going to be right up here at this table, but we want you to line up at the pillar and back that way so we can keep it orderly, and we'll get post-its for your names and all of that. Um, and then before you do that, please fold up your chairs and lean them against something solid. All right, so now that we're done with that, without further ado, I'm excited that we are here to celebrate Dave Barry for his newest book, Swamp Story. This Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times bestselling author and actual Florida man <laughs> has returned with a Florida caper full of oddballs and more twists and turns than a snake slithering away from a gator. For the very few of you who don't know, Dave is a widely popular syndicated columnist best known for his booger jokes. He's the author of more bestsellers than you can count on two hands, which include Lessons from Lucy, Dave Barry's Complete Guide for Got Two Guys, Dave Barry Turns 40, and trust me, Dave Barry is not making this up. <laughs> now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome up to Politics and Prose, Dave Barry. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for coming out. Um, let me get my notes. Um, so I'm on a book tour, and uh, I've been figuring out since I started this tour that, th that this, I have been doing book tours for 40 years. Um, I am, I'm now 75 years old. Yeah. <laughs> Which is mostly bad. Uh, there are a couple of positive things. Um, like 75, they say it's like the new 73. <laughs> and the good, here are the good things. Um, you, you have a little more perspective, I think, when you're um, 75, like when people say, um, if we don't do something about the planet, it's gonna be uninhabitable in 25 years. When you're young, you go, oh, that's bad. But when you're 75, you go, 25 years, I, I can live with that. You know, um, that's good. And also grandchildren are good. I have uh, two grandchildren, two grandsons, and uh, that's nice, except um, when, when they come to see you, they want to play, which is, uh, that's good, that's nice. But where they want to play, uh, which is the floor. <laughs> and when, when, you're, when you're 75, uh, the floor is like North Korea. <laughs> You don't, you don't just go there on the spur of the moment. You know, so, so that's not so good. Everything else is bad. Um, but anyway, so my point is I'm old and I've been on many, many book tours and I was thinking about it. Um, the first, when I, when I first started going on book tours, I was completely unknown. And you know, you just sort of have to scrimp, just do anything you can to get any media anywhere. And I had this incredible good fortune, um, this, my, uh, I had wrote a book, this is 1984, called The Taming of the Screw, which was a short parody of a do-it-yourself book uh, published by Rodale Press. And um, I got a call. I had never, ever been on a television show, not just for the book. I'd just never been on television for anything. And I got a call in my house in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania, from a woman named Shirley Wood, who was a booker for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I later found out it's kind of a legendary Booker, kind of a tough old, you know, show business broad person who smoked a lot of cigarettes. 
And uh, I get this call, and she says, Hi, I'm Shirley Wood. You know, <laughs> I read your book. Your book is funny. Are you funny? You know, and then she starts asking me questions about the, the book, and I give her what I hope are funny answers. And she goes, Uh huh, uh huh, okay, do that. Okay, no, don't do that. Okay. So, but then she agrees to book me on The Tonight Show, which is, just didn't happen. I mean, that was back when that was the show, and it, it, the whole country did really watch that show. And it, it was very, I mean, comedians spent their whole careers trying to get on that show. And, and they, you know, the authors sometimes got them. It was an incredible, lucky thing that I, I don't know, I still don't know how Shirley Wood got my book, but that's what happened. So they flew me out to LA, and I, um, Again, all this was new to me. Flew me out, they picked me up at LAX in a limo. I've never been in a limo before. They take me to the studio, and uh, there are, there are, there's this hallway with the doors of the guests that night, and there's a little star and the name of the guest, and it was like Dick Cavett, the Pointer Sisters, Dave Barry. <laughs> and, you know, and the, the Pointer Sisters had like a whole lot of people to do their hair and makeup, and Dick Cavett had his people. And I just sitting alone in my dressing room. I was wearing the clothes that I'd worn on the plane. That was my outfit for the Tonight Show. Um, so anyway, about half an hour before the show is to start, Shirley Wood comes in, and she's holding a, a tumbler full of white wine. Not just the wine glass, but like you know, 10, 12 ounces. And she goes, drink this. <laughs> and, I, and I did. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in her hands, and then she has this piece of paper with her notes from the questions she asked me and the answers I had given. Uh, and she said, this is what you said, we don't want you to say that. So then, you know, then I'm, I'm feeling better now with the wine, and I'm standing in front of that, I don't know if the older folks remember that famous multicolored curtain, and it opens, Johnny, Johnny Carson says my name, and I go out and sit down, and it's me, and there's Dick Cavett, and there's Ed McMahon, um, and, and uh, Johnny Carson interviews me about my book, and it just goes great. I mean, fantastic. It was, he was so good at it, you know. He would ask the questions just right and listen to the answer, and he'd laugh just the right way at just the right time, let the audience know this was funny. And sometimes we'd go off, off the questions a little bit, but it, was always, it always just made sense. Anyway, it was just easy and smooth and natural, and the audience loved it. And, it's, and, and he even held me over for one, two segments, which I was told later, that was a big deal that Johnny kept you on. Um, and I'll never forget, the, uh, the first segment ends the camera goes off. The instant the camera goes off, Johnny Carson lights a cigarette. And then he turns to me and he goes, remember my book is a parody of do-it-yourself books. He said, I used to do it yourself. You can't do shit yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my conversation with, with Johnny Carson. So then that, it ends, we go back outside and I'm standing with Ed McMahon, waiting, he's waiting for his limo and I'm waiting for my, my we're just getting our limos, you know. <laughs> and he went to some mansion somewhere, I went straight, straight back to LAX and got on a plane, you know, and with a bunch of people didn't, we're not just on The Tonight Show, but I was, you know. <laughs> and, and, um, and get back home and everybody sees the show that night and, you know, it was great. And well, they, anyway, my point was I had this fantastic experience and I, and I came away from it thinking, Man, this is easy. You know, television is so easy. Little did I know that was going to be the high point of my TV interview career. I've been on a million TV shows since then, talking about books that I've written, and it's never been as good since then. And sometimes it's been really, really bad. I was just, that was the first time was the master. Um, since then, I've been on TV shows with, you know, being interviewed by people who not only have not read my book, but have probably never read any book. <laughs> and it can be really painful when they're just reading their questions and they're not really listening to your answer because they're getting ready to ask the next question. Um, so I, I, I was telling it, well, I was in a, a writer's uh, conference in uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, with uh, David McCullough, the late, great historian David McCullough. And we're having dinner, and we start telling those stories about bad things that have happened on, on book tours. And um, he, he won. He had the best one. Uh, he, he told us that in 1978, he was going around promoting The Path Between the Seas, his book about the building of the Panama Canal. It's a wonderful book. And he's on a morning TV show with a guy who's got his questions that the producer has written for him, but is clearly, you know, doesn't know who David is or anything else. And at, at one point, the guy asks um, David, how did he feel about the, U, the, United Sta uh, the United States turning the Panama Canal over to the Republic of Panama, which was a big issue at the time? And David's answer was, he said, I think that the Panama Canal will, in a sense, always be American territory 
like Normandy Beach? And the guy looks really puzzled and says, who is Norman D. Beach? <laughs> Which is far more typical of the book tour experience than you might. So you, you become, you'll do anything on a book tour to promote your book. You'll go on any show and you'll, you'll basically do whatever. They, they, t they give you a schedule and you'll just do whatever's on the schedule. Um, I, w this is in the 90s. I was on a book tour and I was in St. Louis. And I got a call from my publicist who said, the Oprah show called and they're interested in having you on a panel tomorrow in Chicago and we'll fly you there, but you gotta talk to the, the, the producer first and make sure this is something you can do. And so like, you know, the Oprah show, you do always said yes to the Oprah show because um, Oprah was famous for selling lots of books. So the publicist calls me, I mean, the, the, excuse me, the producer calls me and said, we're doing a show and the theme is, we want you to be on the panel, the theme is writing wrongs. What we're gonna do is have people on the panel confess to things they've done wrong and then make it right on the air. <laughs> And so, do you have something like that? So I'm racking my brains, uh, my brain, I only brain one brain, and I'm racking it though. And, um, and I, uh, I, I came up with something, um, which was a few years before that, I had been in a Hyatt hotel, and in the uh, bathroom was a plastic sign, like a, you know, a V-shaped sign, and it said, our guest towels are 100% cotton, uh, should you desire, to purchase a set, they are available for sale for $75. Should you prefer to take the set already in your room, we will charge you that amount on your bill. That was another way of saying, if you steal our towels, it will charge you $75. So I stole the sign. <laughs> uh, I thought it was kind of funny and put it in our guest bathroom and had it there for a few years and people thought it was pretty fun. So I told the Oprah producer this story. <laughs> she said, that is perfect. Um, you, what you'll do, you'll bring the sign, come on the show, we'll have a box and you're going to drop this. So you tell the story, then you drop the sign in the box and we'll get it back to the Hyatt Hotel people. So the problem there was that I was in St. Louis and the sign was in Miami where I live and the show was the next day in Chicago. So there was no way to get the sign to the show. And then it occurred to me that I was staying in another Hyatt Hotel. <laughs> So I stole another sign. <laughs> this one had nothing to do with towels. It was like no smoking or something. But I, you know, you couldn't tell that from a distance. So I took it, had it in my pocket, and then I went on an Oprah show, told the story on the air, and dropped the sign into the the box. And the point I'm making here is, I I was willing to steal another sign and lie <laughs> to, on a show about righting wrongs. You know, that that's kind of horror you are on book tour. So, <laughs> so here I am now doing that, um, talking about um, Swamp Story. And uh, my favorite single thing about this book, I just have to, if, if you uh, look at the back of it, we have blurbs on books, you know, it's blurbs is a thing you do in the book business where you ask your friends to write, to say, you know, what they thought of the book and they, of course, love it. You'll never read a blurb that says, eh, you know. <laughs> And it's just it's something you do, and you know, nobody should ever take blurbs seriously, is the truth. Uh, but anyway, so when, when I had turned in the manuscript, they said, this is great, can you get some you know, blurbs? And so I asked two, two people, I asked Carl Hyacin, who's a, a friend of mine and a wonderful writer of Florida novels, and, um, and Steve Martin, who I've known for years, and I wrote for his, when he, he hosted the Oscars a couple times, I was on, on the writing staff for those shows, so I've known Steve, Steve for a long time. So Carl you know, read the book and wrote a blurb, and that's the first blurb. Steve said, I'm in the middle of filming, it's, um, only murders in the building, the show he's doing, he said, I, but here, and then right in his answer, you know, without having seen the book, he writes five blurbs for the book. <laughs> that's the way the blurb business, where he says, pick, you know, whatever, mix and match, do whatever you want. So I, I says, okay, I'm just gonna use them all. <laughs> so there are six blurbs on the back of the book. One is from Carl, and the other five are from Steve Martin. And his last blurb is, I haven't read it yet, but I love it. So, <laughs> which is fairly honest uh, blurb. So anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about the book. Um, then I will I'll read a little bit from the book, and then 
I'll take questions if you have any. Um, so the book, it, it, the swamp in the in swamp story is the Everglades. I I, it's, I live in Miami. Um, my joke, I, I moved there in 1986 from the United States, and <laughs> and I'm I'm a defender of of Miami. Uh, it's it has a reputation that sort of started with the Miami Vice years, where people still think of it if they've never been, especially <laughs> as a dangerous and violent place. And we want to track those people down and kill them because. <laughs> It's, a, a, it, it's not, it's a change. It's a lot better than it used to be. We have a new attitude, new tourism promotion slogan. I had bumper stickers made up at one point. They said, come back to Miami, we weren't shooting at you. So, <laughs> so, so I live in Miami, um, and I'm a defender of Florida, I, I, of Miami and, and of the state of Florida. Florida has a bad reputation also. It's sort of become the joke state. It started with the... Uh, the 2000 presidential election. That's really when the, the, the Florida image started to tarnish badly. Uh, you may recall this, it was uh, Bush versus Gore, and uh, during the course of election night, all of the other states were able to determine who they had voted for using arithmetic. Um, <laughs> but Miami, or not Miami, Florida, was unable to, come, uh, to solve that problem. So it was a long, long night, and it, it mattered because whoever won Florida was gonna be the next president, and so first they called it for Bush, and then they called it for Gore, and then late, 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 they called it for Bush again, and then I think briefly William Shatner was in the lead, you know. <laughs> so it was a brutal long night. And that began the whole hanging Chad thing. I assume most of you remember that, and it was just the butt of all the jokes on the late night shows in Florida, 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 a bunch of idiots in Florida. And that sort of kept going. You know, that was sort of the beginning of we are stupid in Florida. But then this whole Florida man thing started where people began to notice that there are a lot of really weird stories and it all seemed to come from Florida, you know, and, and it became this whole genre of news, the Florida man thing. There's books about it, there's TV shows about it, Florida man. And uh, we, we, we hear this constantly down there. I, I gotta, is it really fair though? Um, to, this is a, a state with 21 million people. Is it really fair to judge 21 million people just because of the actions of 19 million people? <laughs> <laughs> because it does seem we have a lot of, um, of strange acting people. But, but I contend it's not necessarily what it seems. And I will explain what I mean by that in the form of an anecdote. True story which you may remember because it was big news when it happened. Um, this anecdote involves a woman who was driving south on the overseas highway that connects the mainland Florida with Key West. It's a beautiful drive uh, down, to the, down to Key West. And uh, the, according to the Florida State Highway Patrol report written on this event, which became international news, uh, this woman was in a hurry to get to Key West because her boyfriend was down there. She wanted to see her boyfriend. So she's in a hurry. She also wants to look good for him. So she decides on the way that she should shave her bikini region. Now, some people would pull over to the side of the road. <laughs> but as I say, she was in a hurry. So according, again, this is all in the police report. She decided to outsource the steering of the car to the passenger who was, and this is one of the things that made this story so famous, her ex-husband. So <laughs> this is all true. So. So they're going south now at about 40 miles an hour. Uh, she is operating the accelerator but not looking at the road because she's shaving her bikini region. And his ex-husband is over here. What could possibly go wrong? So what happened was the car in front of them slowed down uh, to make a turn and they slammed into it and that was the accident which was reported in great detail by a, a, a pretty literate Florida State Highway Patrolman and that became well, we ran it in the Miami Herald, and then it went all over the world. Everybody loved that story. Every morning zoo t talk show, many other newspapers, every late night uh, TV show, all loved that story. And it all was blamed on us, the Florida, Florida people. Can, can you believe these idiots in Florida? Did you read this, wo this Flor woman in Florida, this moron woman, she's saving herself. Florida, Florida, Florida. That woman was from Indiana. Okay, she was shaving her Hoosier. Um, but she came to Florida to do that, and that has been our problem for all these years. We are like the Ellis Island 
<laughs> for stupid people. They, they don't do whatever they want to do in their own state. They come to Florida. And we have tried to stop them. We are trying everything we can. We are raising the sea levels. <laughs> we elected Ron DeSantis. We're doing all we can. To keep, but they keep coming. They keep coming. So that's, that's, um, that's my state. That's my city, Miami State. And the book, every, every novel I've written, uh, every novel that I've written alone for grown-ups is based in, in, in Miami. This one's based a little west of Miami in the Everglades. If you've ever flown to Miami, you'll notice that the, most of the state down there is just this gigantic swamp, and the, the city is just this little, on, on both sides, just a little dense urban area, a couple miles wide, and then instantly it transforms and becomes this swamp. And when you first get there, at least for me, you, you just drive across the Everglades and you just think it's just, you know, grass and water and maybe some alligators out there somewhere. But it, it just seems like a big, vast, empty thing. That's not the case, though. There are actually roads and communities and people, weird people sometimes, back in the Everglades. And this story that I wrote sort of brings a bunch of those elements together. It connects them with the city of Miami. There were a couple of things that I wanted to include. And it, this is, this is a, uh, a thing about being a novelist in, in Miami. Carl Heisen uh, says, you don't, need, you don't need an imagination. You just need a subscription to the Miami Herald because <laughs> nothing you can make up would be weirder than what's actually going on. Like the first novel I wrote about Florida was called Big Trouble. And in it, one of the key elements was a bar where uh, Russians were selling nuclear weapons that they got from the, when, from the collapse of the Soviet Union out of a bar in Miami. And people said, where'd you get that idea? And I said, I got it from a story in the Miami Herald about a bar in Miami where Russians <laughs> were selling nuclear weapons. So that's where I thought that up from. <laughs> and, uh, and, things, uh, and things like that, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you one. I could tell you nothing but uh, stories of, of weird things that have, true things that have happened in Miami. Um, one of my favorite, and it happened not too long after I got there, uh, I went down and, and wrote a column about it, was uh, there was a, a guy named Kurt Ivey who was the chief of police of Homestead, which is a city south of Miami. And uh, he, as chief of police, was asked to speak at the inaugural meeting of a citizen's crime watch group that was forming in the neighborhood. And so they, you know, a good crowd showed up in the neighborhood and they, they held a meeting outdoors on somebody's patio. So chief of police talking to these suburban folks about how the Citizen Crime Watch is supposed to work. And it's going fine right up until Kurt is almost hit on the head by a 75 pound bale of cocaine falling from the sky. <laughs> that really happened. Um, what, what it, was, it was a smuggler's plane uh, coming over from the Bahamas loaded up with cocaine. And they were intercepted by a customs service jet, and which was forcing them, trying to force them down. And so the smugglers are in the back of their plane just flinging these gales of <laughs> cocaine out as fast as they can, one of which almost hit, hurt, uh, hit Kurt. And then they finally got him down in Naples, but they, they, they threw about 20 bags out, it was estimated, which set off a treasure hunt in the Everglades like the next day. <laughs> but the point, you, if you were to write a you know, screenplay with that scene in it, the chief of police at a crime watch meeting, they, they, they would just laugh and say, no, come on, come up with something that could really happen. But that did happen. It just would never happen in Milwaukee, would it? It's only, <laughs> only a, so anyway, that's, when, it, when enough things strike you, you know, you begin to think, how can I, how can I incorporate that into a story? The first thing that, that I knew I wanted to include in, in Swamp Story, and the, the, the beginning of the idea of writing a book about the Everglades, involves something we do in Florida called the Python Challenge. Has anybody ever heard of the Python? Some of, some of you, okay. It's a real thing. Uh, people don't believe it. Um, but it is the most Florida possible thing. Um, we have a problem with Burmese pythons, which are these giant pythons. They're like, they have to be 15 feet long, humongous snakes. Um, who should not be there? They should be in Burma, okay? <laughs> Which is now Myanmar, Myanmar. So that's probably why they don't go back. So, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, th they're an invasive species. They shouldn't be. What happened is people had them as pets, and then at some point these people ran out of crack <laughs> and realized they were living with giant invasive, you know, giant constrictor snakes. So they let them go. And the pythons love it there in Florida. They, they love it. They thrive. They're like New Yorkers, you know? <laughs> 
and they they multiply and they don't pay any taxes and no they, they the, the pythons love it and they have no natural enemies they eat everything so they they're they're multiplying like crazy there are, the estimates are they're in the hundreds of thousands of pythons out there in the everglades These gigantic snakes eating everything so the state of florida had to figure out what to do about that and came up with a really florida solution um, which is the python challenge which is it in this is maybe 10 years now we've been doing it it's a contest to hold every year where we invite anybody who wants to to come down and kill our pythons and if whoever it's ever gets you get cash prizes for the biggest python and the longest python and the most pythons and and so on and, and it attracts the kind of person who would view that as a good thing to do you know <laughs> and a lot of a lot of beard bearded people um, <laughs> in, including the women no that's and anyway um, so and, and it's run by the state, so there's a certain organ at the Florida State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, which has a wonderful website. I urge you to go see it just to see the rules of the Python Challenge. You have to fill out a registration form, and I think you pay a small fee. And then we're not going to just let you go out there and do this. You have to take a short online course. <laughs> now, you ask anybody who's ever dealt with dangerous animals in the wild how you learn to do that. A short online course is how you learn. <laughs> And there's a certain way you kill the python. You have to kill them humanely. Um, like, to me, the way to kill a python is cut, chop its head off, and then, then you're good, right? They, no, not allowed to do that in state because it's inhumane, and it says so right in the Florida State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission website. Because if you chop off the head, you haven't destroyed the brain, and the brain keeps on thinking. It doesn't say what it's thinking. Like, <laughs> holy shit, you know, like, you know, like so, so every year we have this thing and these people come down and they make a big deal out of it and then they announce the results. And typically the results are that we get between two and 300 pythons killed in the python challenge. Now do the math. There are hundreds of thousands, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of pythons out there. So a couple hundred not gonna make a dent and all the females lay eggs, like a hundred eggs each. You know, so the, my point is the pythons are winning the python challenge. <laughs> They're killing us, okay? We should have challenged an animal we could be, like manatees or something. No, no, no. we're not going to challenge the manatees. For one thing, it would be too easy. No, I, I, uh, I actually, a big, I'm a pro manatee person. I'm the only person I know who actually proposed a solution to the problem we have with the manatees, which is boaters keep running into them. Boaters in Florida drive the way drivers in Florida drive, which is like everybody drives according to the laws of his or her individual country of origin. Um, <laughs> boaters are terrible and, and they go too fast and they hit the manatees and they have all these efforts to slow the boaters down and it doesn't work. So my proposal was if we can't slow the boaters down, let's speed the manatees up. <laughs> I thought we could get some federal money and, and buy some motors and <laughs> propellers, put them on the manatees. And when a boater is killed by a manatee going 70 or 80 miles an hour, then the other boaters are going to start thinking about it. That's my feeling. You know. So don't mock me, okay? For the... So anyway, that was the, one of the things I wanted to include in the Python Challenge. Uh, another one I wanted to include was a thing called the skunk ape. Um, the skunk ape, again, a real thing. Um, there's in the middle of, of the, the Tamiami Trail, Route 41, the old road connecting Miami and Tampa. Now everybody takes Route 75, which is faster and everything. The old road uh, that everybody used to drive on had some tourist attractions along the way, airboat rides and people wrestling alligators. And most of them are dead now. And the government doesn't want them there. Federal government would like them all to leave. And they wanted to return to just being wetlands and whatever. So, but this one is still out there. It's the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. And the skunk ape is this, uh, it's, um, this creature that some people claim to have seen, but we, probably is imaginary, like a Bigfoot or the person you're waiting on hold to speak to at customer service. You know, <laughs> probably is not really there. But this guy, there's a guy named Dave Sheely um, out there who claims to have seen it, and there's some fuzzy pictures and everything. And he's basically the skunk ape research headquarters sells T-shirts and other merchandise related to the skunk ape. So I liked that. I did a, a book a few years ago called Best State Ever, where I went around to places like that. And I wanted to incorporate that into the, this book. And so I invented these guys who also live out on the Tamiami Trail 
who are in a failing tourist attraction, but they don't have the skunk ape going for them. They got nothing. And so they come up with this idea to invent a creature. Um, they're not that imaginative, but they, they, they want to invent a creature. They, 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 they aspire to be the skunk ape research headquarters. These are not particularly bright people. Um, and they talk this guy, this drunk ex-newspaper guy who is desperate for money, into posing as this, what they, what they call the Everglade melon monster, Everglades melon monster, which is this creature with this an enormous head. And the way they do, they get this uh, drunk ex-newspaper man named Phil to put on a Dora the Explorer costume <laughs> head, and they shoot him in low light out there, stumbling around. Anyway, so that's their idea. It's a really stupid idea, and it shouldn't work, except for one thing, and this is the third thing I really wanted to include in the book, TikTok. <laughs> TikTok, which I know about because I have a 23-year-old daughter. Um, a lot of you are old, though, and you might not know about TikTok, so I'm going to tell you. It is an app invented by the Chinese to keep us from ever doing anything productive again in this country. <laughs> They're over there making things, and we're over here going, oh, my God, look at that dog. <laughs> oh, look at that dog. They're doing a dance. That's like, oh, look at the dog again. And, Oh, and they're making ravioli with a tennis racket. Um, there's a dog, another dog. And then by before you know it, it's nighttime and you're still in your pajamas, you know. And over in China, they made 800 million television sets during that time. So anyway, as it happens, these morons with the video of the Everglades Melon Monster get on TikTok and somehow, and this can happen, and this is one of the wonderful things about TikTok, it goes viral all over the world <coughs> and without having any idea why they are suddenly incredibly in the middle of this you know, intense world, world, world of publicity. So anyway, that's sort of the basic setup of the book. I'm just going to read you a little bit of it to give you a, a, a vibe of it. Um, this is a scene where the guys who are making these videos, um, who are not bright, except for one, the guy Phil, who is me. He's the me character in the book. So I get the things I would say he says. Um, and, and they're out getting, they're, they're, their first video has become this worldwide phenomenon, and they're capital, trying to capitalize by making another video. But before they do that, they have to get extremely high on marijuana, because that's who they are. That's how they operate, these guys. So they're sitting around smoking um, some very powerful marijuana, and this scene occurs. And I, I, when I was researching the book, I drove around out in the Everglades on some of the back roads, and one day just came across this owl, gigantic owl in the middle of the day, standing in trees, kind of a scary looking owl, big, bigger than I thought owls were supposed to be. And it's called a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, and they're, they're an aggressive kind of owl that lives in the Everglades. So anyway, that's what this scene is involved. Look, said Kark, pointing toward a tree at the edge of the clearing. The others looked. Sitting on one of the lower tree branches, looking back at them, was a large owl. That's a barred owl, said Ken. They live out here. Ken is, lives in the Everglades, and he's the guy who thought of the melon monster idea. And he's, in the daytime, said Slater. Slater is one of the characters who hates Ken, and Ken hates him. So anyway, I'll, I won't keep interrupting, but I'm interrupting myself. Uh, <laughs> that's a barred owl, says Ken. They live out here. In the daytime, said Slater. Yes, in the daytime, said Ken. Also the nighttime. What, you think they commute? <laughs> No, asshole, said Slater. I mean, owls come out at night. Maybe you should tell that one, said Ken. You're thinking of bats, said Stu. They fly around at night by radar. Owls fly at night, too, said Slater. That's an expression. Night owl. Ken rolled his eyes. Phil, Phil, looking at Stu, said, did you say bats fly by radar? Yeah, said Stu. I saw a documentary. They use radar to catch bugs. I saw that, too, said Slater, nodding. Animal planet. It's sonar, said Phil. What is, said Stu. Bats use sonar, said Phil, not radar. I think you're thinking of submarines, said Stu. <laughs> I am not thinking of submarines, said Phil. Submarines use sonar, said Stu. He's right, said Slater. No, he's not right, said Phil. You're saying submarines don't use sonar, said Slater? No, said Phil. I mean, yes, submarines use sonar. Well, that's what he said, said Slater. I know that's what he said, said Phil. You don't have to shout, said Slater. <laughs> Phil took a deep breath, exhaled. Okay, he said. The point is, yes, submarines use sonar. But bats also use sonar. Bats do not use radar. Airplanes use radar. <laughs> According to you, said Slater. <laughs> no, said Phil. According to science. You're telling me Animal Planet isn't science, said Slater? 
Jesus H. Christ, said Phil. <laughs> okay, said Stu, speaking unnaturally slowly. Hear me out, Phil. Airplanes fly, right? Yes, said Phil. And bats also fly, right? <laughs> right, said Phil. But submarines do not fly, right? <laughs> right, but what? I rest my case, said Stu. <laughs> He has you there, said Slater. <laughs> he doesn't have shit, said Phil. Dude, you need to calm down, said Slater, handing Phil a third joint. It's just a discussion. Yeah, said Phil, taking the joint, but it's a stupid discussion. Maybe so, said, maybe so dude, said Slater, but you're like half of it. So, <laughs> so those are the guys who are a big part of the plot, and nothing they do works out well. Um, <laughs> And there's also a love story, but I'm not going to go into that now, but there's a tender and, a, and deeply affecting love story in this book. <laughs> so anyway, that gives you an idea about the book. Um, and now, let's see if you have any questions. And if you do, you're supposed to come up to this microphone and ask them, but if you want to just yell them out, I'll repeat them to the, to the group, unless it's something really personal and private. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, or did I cover everything? Yes. So I was curious about the bad songs pulled. Do you think the results would be different if we did that with Amsterdam? The question is, he's curious about the bad songs poll, and do I think the results would be different if we did it today? You're referring, he's referring to a book I wrote called Dave Barry's book of bad songs, which I wrote long ago. Uh, what happened was this. I wrote a column, as I did every week, and in that column, and this was not the point of the column, okay, I happened to mention that I didn't think Neil Diamond was the greatest lyricist who ever lived. <laughs> Specifically referring to the song where he sings with great passion and intensity, I am, I said, to no one there, and no one heard it all, not even the chair. <laughs> Which, you know, I feel like, no kidding, Neil. Um, <laughs> Probably the table didn't pick up on it either because <laughs> these are articles of furniture. So, uh, but it, that was not the point of the, the column. It was just the throwaway thing in the middle of the column. Well, you think Salman Rushdie got in trouble. Um, <laughs> I got really angry mail from the Neil Diamond people. And they're out there, and like, I got many, many letters of spittle on them. Like, <laughs> How dare you, Mr. Barry? How dare you insult this great artist, Mr. Barry? I had a goiter on my neck, and I listened to Heartlight 14 times, and it healed that go. You know. <laughs> so it. Anyway, but when you're a columnist, it, yes, this Mr. Gene Weingarten will back me up on this. When you get angry mail like that, it's good for you because then you can write another column about the mail. So I wrote a whole other column about. Um, all the, you know, like all the angry Neil Diamond people and ha, ha, ha. And, but that's just really stirred the pot out. There's a lot of people agreed with me about that song and wanted, wanted to talk about other songs they didn't like. Um, and, and, you know, you th people say Americans don't care about the issues, but this, <laughs> this is an issue people care about. I, I, found, I got, and then I wrote another column about, you know, like, look at all this. And people were all naming the songs like they don't like, like Honey, and you know, just on and on. And so then I, I just started getting, and anyway, it's, long story short, I got 20,000 letters and, you know, about songs people hated. And I wrote a book, which is what you're referring to, and it was where I, I summarized as best I could. The, just you, so you know, the, the, so, the, the song voted worst song of all time in this survey was um, uh, MacArthur Park. Someone left the cake out in the rain. And I think number two was Having My Baby, which is by either Neil Sedaka or Paul Anka. I don't think, I, I think you need, um, I think they're genetically the same person. And, and I think was, the third was Yummy, 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 I've Got Love in My Tummy. But anyway, and there were lots of other songs. And, and to this day, people still will come up to me sometimes and say, you know, you, you know that song about the horse with no name? I hate that song, you know. <laughs> I, had a, I had a friend, uh, the late comedian, uh, Rich Jenny, who used to say, you're in, the, you're in the desert, you got nothing to do. Name the freaking horse, you know. <laughs> you know. But to answer your question, though, would it be different today? The, I think it'd be impossible today because there's no like 
that that was sort of toward the end of when we were all basically listening to sort of the same music for the most part the top 40 and whatever that's just gone now everybody listens to whatever they want to listen to and you know if you're me you think all of it's horrible anyway you know if the, i'm an old person um so i i don't i don't think you could do it i just don't think enough people would even know what songs the other people were talking about to hate them you know so yes sir Can, can I tell you, this gentleman wants to know about my reading diet, my news diet every day. Actual newspapers like that I read? I read my local paper, which is the Miami Herald, which is getting smaller all the time. I read the New York Times, which I get delivered. And I read um, the Wall Street Journal, because my son works there. Um, yeah, uh, thank <laughs> God they employed my son. Anyway, I told him, don't go into this business, but he did. Um, and then just whatever, you know, scattered around. But I read a lot of crap also. You know, I read Twitter sometimes and stuff like that. Um, nothing, nothing unusual, though, I don't think. So, any other, any other, yes? So, we're going to keep this on the topic of your children and mine. You said you have a 24-year-old daughter. Yes. My 24-year-old daughter listens to Miami. What's nice about that is that she has a 24 24-year-old daughter just moved to Miami. What advice would I give? Oh, man. Um, well, can you, can you get her out? You know? <laughs> No, I, I don't know. Um, do you know, we, this is, I don't want to get this too far in the weeds, but where in Miami does she live and what does she do? Oh, she lives in Coral Gables. Coral Gables. I live in Coral Gables, okay. So she's good. Yeah. And she has a job and everything with dental, dental benefits? <laughs> Medical? Benefit. Just leave her there. Don't, don't change a thing. You know, until the sea level gets us. Everybody keeps telling us that um, we're going to be underwater. I don't know what people keep moving there anyway, but. My, she can come to my house, it's 23 feet above sea level, which in Miami is like Mount Everest, you know, that's really high. So like when it, all, my, all our neighbors have like jellyfish in their family room, I'm gonna be like, ha, now who's laughing at whose house, you know? So she can come over and we'll all just watch the water come up, and anyway. He, they're very strict, they want you to use the microphone. I was repeating the questions as instructed, but okay. Yes, sir. So, so uh, I guess at what point do you uh, make the call that something like uh, some of the like real anecdotes you've been talking about uh, cross over to being able to sustain the full novel? Um, okay, it's it really was more like it had to be, you know, I I I wanted the I knew I wanted the Python challenge in the novel, and I I knew I wanted the Skunk Ape in the novel, but that really doesn't make a story. You know, I have to create characters who are doing something around that. The, the story I told at the beginning about the woman shaving herself, when, when I wrote my book, Best State Ever, I included that in the introduction of the book. <laughs> the same year, Carl Hyacin wrote a book, and it was called Razor Girl. <laughs> Independent of, that, of me, he had also decided, but then he made a whole novel out of it, but he has this, you know, this woman who did this become this completely different character. So, there's no like tipping point where it's suddenly you know this would have to be, um, you know this this will work for a novel because you have to come up with the whole plot around it and the characters and the motivations and stuff like that. It's like I don't know. There's there's no particular magical point. I think it's just it's just something that, that stands out enough that you'd want to use it in the in the book. There's another one that I've always wanted to use, and I, I'll maybe figure out how to do it someday. Um, I was at the Miami Herald one day and I, my phone rings. And I got it, and it's a woman I know, and she said, I'm on the People Mover. Now, the People Mover is a, a little tram, automated tram that goes in a certain loop around downtown Miami. She goes, I'm on the People Mover, and there's a shark on the People Mover. <laughs> and it's not dead. <laughs> and so, and she took a picture and sent it to me, and it was a shark on the People Mover, and, and which is not designed for marine life. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's why we call it the people mover. And <laughs> what happened was, and the Herald had a big story about this the next day. These two guys, uh, homeless guys, were fishing in Biscayne Bay, and they caught this six-foot nurse shark. And they, they, for some reason, thought they could sell it to a restaurant. Um, there are some seafood restaurants on the Miami River across town. So they had this six big shark. Um, 
and they're carrying it around and they, they decide since they don't have a car they'll take it on the people mover <laughs> and they did and then they get to her and they you know when they get there they find out they're nobody's gonna buy their shark so they just leave it on the street <laughs> so the next day the story in the Herald was like shark on street you know and my my favorite quote from that was um, there was a, a shopkeeper in downtown Miami he said when I got to work I saw it and I was really upset at first because I thought it was a body but then I was, I was relieved that it was just a shark. You know? <laughs> it's like a, a feel-good story, you know? <laughs> I but I mean, I, someday, if you read a, a, a story about a shark on people who are, that's where it came from. But again, true story, so. Thanks. <coughs> Hi. I want to ask a serious question. Okay. And, um, I'm a big fan. I love the year in review that you do every year, every time for the Washington Post, and I've read a lot of your books. And I was just reading Dave Barry's Greatest Hits today, and uh, chapter after chapter, just yucking it up with you. And then all of a sudden, I got to a million words. Oh, yeah. Do you know what that is? Sure. Uh, yeah, Mr. Dean Weingarten was involved in the writing of that. Um, yeah, my, uh, my dad died. Yeah. And, and I, it was just like a gut punch. Well, to think me. how I felt. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know. No, I know. I it. wasn't expecting it. You, th you, th you thought it was. Good. I didn't know he'd been sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you hate to find but out then, this way. But then, but I remember from your other book which might have been when Dave Barry turns 40, I'm not sure which one, but when your mother died. My mom. She was so overtaken that your dad had died. Yeah, my mom committed suicide th a couple so, of years after my dad. Anyway. So anyway. I don't know. It, it makes me feel closer to you well, to have read you. this, but I just wondered, didn't your one of your editors say, hey, that's not funny. Well, <laughs> no. He, the, the, no, he did not say that. Are you his editor? Yes. yes. Gene, Gene Weingarten edited that, that column. But wow. I'll tell you what, I mean, he, I've written a few serious things in my life. That When my dad died, uh, when my mom died, when my son got, my son got hit by a car, I, a couple of other things. Everything, the, when I wrote a serious thing, it was because something horrible had happened. And it kind of was... I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't get going until I write something about this, yeah. so I'm going to write about it, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I'll be done with it. And I have been some, you know, people very nice sometimes say, you, you should write more serious things, you know, because I, I like them, and I, and I, I think, yeah, but I don't want serious things to happen. <laughs> so, so, so I generally don't write, uh, don't write serious things for that reason. But Gene Weingarten, I, I remember calling him and saying, I, you know, can I write this? And Gene encouraged me to. And um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. And it affected you. It asked, yeah. I remember yeah. it a lot. I wouldn't say more. Yeah, a lot more than a lot of us have done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, have, we was like, we're getting confessional here now. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Oh, you can stay there, and I'll. Yeah, okay. We'll. We're, we're going. We're going rogue here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> How much do I love Ron DeSantis? How much material? Look at you know, the man. You, you. We have our criticism of him, but he is standing up bravely against the single biggest threat that we face today, which is Disney. <laughs> I think that's where he really lost the state because I just, I know some people kind of like him, but I don't know anybody's going like, whoa, we got to do something about Disney. That's the one, one problem we've got in this state. We got to do something. I've never heard anything remotely like that. So anyway, would you, do you want to hear what I think we should do about the, about, I have a, also, a, okay, I'm, I don't want to get political, um, but I do have a, a a comment to make about the, pre the 2024 presidential election. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. It's mildly political. Okay. Nobody's happy right now with the choices. Um, it's, you know, maybe some of you are, but the polls show it, you know, it's, if it's, it's going to be Trump and, and Biden again, people are, are not happy about it. Um, and it's very good odds that Donald Trump will be on trial for because, um, no, for the $130,000 that his lawyer paid to Stormy Daniels because he, according to him, did not have an affair with her, um, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> Why else would you pay $130,000 to a porn star 
if not because you had not had sex with her, okay? <laughs> and I just want to get it on the record. I also have never had sex with Stormy Daniels. <laughs> so I guess I owe her $130,000. <laughs> also, but, so anyway, he, he's good. And, and, and he insists, still insists that he won the 2020 election. So I, I have a solution, which is, I don't know what the legal mechanism would be, but I'm sure we could do it, which is we would um, get, take that case to the Supreme Court, his contention that he won the 2020 election. And then right before the 2024 election, I want the Supreme Court to say, he's right. He won the 2020 election. And he has now almost completed his second term. <laughs> the legal maximum. Thank you for your service. So, but the other problem is, is President Biden, and I, I don't know how we all feel, but the, the perception I think most people have is that he's a very nice man who figures out what's going on only as he reads it on the teleprompter. So, I don't know what to do about that. But anyway, th that's where we stand on the, uh, the 2024 election. And then Ron DeSantis, but I don't think he's gonna. Oh, okay, I got that. Any, any other, yes sir? I don't have a question, but I don't want you to stop talking. So okay. I'm just trying to think of something. Like, who, who are your biggest influences growing up? And what did your parents think about your career choice? And just keep talking. Okay? Um, well, OK, I can, my, my biggest influence, which since she's already come up once in this conversation, was my mother. My mother was a very funny lady. Uh, she obviously had her demons. Um, she suffered from depression and that sort of thing. But she was the funniest person. Um, and I, I grew up in the 50s. I was, uh, so my, and when there were four of us Barry kids. So my mom was basically a housewife, which is what a lot of you know, women did then. And, and so she would like, you know, take us around. I grew up in this little town, Armont, New York. And so she was like living this sort of housewife existence, doing, you know, the errands and, you know, making the meals and all that stuff and taking care of the kids. But she had this like edge to her that made her like different from the other moms. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we had a pond behind our house. And my sister Kate and I, when we were little, used to go play in the pond, which like now can you imagine that? Like the federal pond police would come and arrest your parents. But back then, we just go off to the pond. You know, we'd go, we'd go out to the pond. My mom would roll up the kitchen window and go, don't drown, kids. You know? <laughs> It was big, cheerful June Cleaver. And we, we go, we won't. You know, we just thought that was funny because that, that's the kind of thing my mom did. Or, we, or she would take us to, to do errands in, in downtown Armonk, which was a little village. And you would go to the Louis the Cleaner and the, you know, the drugstore and Brissetti's Market. And she'd go in and you know, be everybody shopping. And Ray Brissetti would be, and the trades tradespeople all loved my mom. The, the, uh, Ray Brissetti would be slicing, he was a left-handed man. No, he would be slicing, <laughs> slicing the bologna and he'd go, how are you doing, Marion? They all called her Marion. She'd go, just shitty, Ray, you know? <laughs> and she would just had this way about her. And like if something was, you know, if somebody's down about something, she would go, someday we'll all be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, the, but the way, and my dad was pretty funny too, but, Really, my mom was the edgy one, and just nothing, nothing that she would not make fun of, nothing she would not, uh, you, and the worst thing you could do in our family was take anything too seriously, especially uh, yourself. So like, when my dad died, um, I, the day we buried him, he was in a, you know, we had his ashes in a box, and we went to the Middle Patton Cemetery, and they had dug a hole for us to put the ashes in, and it was raining. It was like just perfectly gloomy, you know, funerally day. And, um, and just, just the family, just my mom and my sister Kate and my two brothers and me, we have, the, we have the box and we put it in the hole, we put some dirt on it and we all say some stuff and we're all crying, you know. And then we start to walk away from the grave and I got my arm around my mom and we're both kind of weeping and she looks down at, at one of the graves markers and says, so that's why we don't see him around anymore. <laughs> you know? Like even then, my mom, you know, she could not resist, so. That, that really is where I got my sense of humor. It was from my mom, is this, 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 this general feeling that everything, you, you know, whatever you can make fun of, you should make fun of. So I hope that answers the question. Anyway, it wasn't really a question. It was just like, keep talking <laughs> instruction. Any other? What's your favorite song? 
Wait, this, she's, she's at the microphone. <laughs> Can you talk about the, the rock bottom remainders? Oh, the rock. I'll talk about the rock bottom remainders. This is, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll, you know, engage in commerce. <laughs> rock bottom remainders is a, is a band of authors that uh, was started in 1992, and it was supposed to be a one-night thing to raise money for a First Amendment uh, charity in, in a, at a booksellers convention in Los Angeles. And uh, Stephen King, it was a man, it was this woman named Kathy Goldbart, just, she faxed, because this was days of fax, all of the artists, the authors she knew and asked, if, you know, anybody wanted to come in this band, we're gonna start a band and just do this show one night. So anybody who agreed to do it became part of the band. It was Stephen King, Amy Tan, Barbara King Solver, Robert Fulgham, Roy Blunt Jr., me, Ridley Pearson, uh, a bunch of other people. Over the years, other people have joined us, Scott Tarot, <coughs> Um, Greg Isles, uh, I'm probably leaving some names, Mitch Album. So there's a lot of good authors, but we're not a good band. Um, <laughs> we play, Roy Blunt Jr. described our genre as hard listening music. <laughs> um, and uh, as I described, we play what I call the rumor method of music. I don't know how many of you are musicians, but everybody's you know, playing something, and then a rumor will go around the band that there's been a chord change. <laughs> um, Mr. Gene Weingarten has performed with our band. He, he plays harmonica, and, and it sounds like, no matter what he's actually playing, it sounds like he's playing Oh Susanna. <laughs> but, Tell him how I learned how to play. He learned to play, how to play harmonica from my, my brother Sam over the telephone. <laughs> My brother, my brother Sam is actually a world-class harmonica player. He's a very, very good musician. And, but he, and he did his best with Gene, but it, did, it still sounds like Oh Susanna. But anyway, so, so anyway, um, the, I, I have, uh, we've had a great time playing with this band. And, and, and we, we still, every now and then, some of us get together. We played last summer at Nantucket, the Nantucket Book Festival, uh, where we did a song I wrote called Moby Dick to the, to the tune of um, Alley Oop. So the backup singer is Moby Dick, 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 Dick that's, that's the song. That's my favorite song, if you want to you know. So, uh, here's the one line from it. They had messed up and fell off the ship, but Moby Dick, 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 Dick. Moby swallowed his leg like a Pringle chip, but Moby Dick, Dick, Dick. Uh, uh, that's the song. Anyway, I don't usually do that a cappella. Uh, so, so um, but I have one cautionary tale from playing in a band. Um, other bands, this is what we've been told, um, practice the songs ahead of time. <laughs> and that's the one area we have fallen short. What we, what we do is we play a gig, and then later on we say, boy, we should have practiced some of those. <laughs> But, but then it's too late, so we just go to a bar. So, so here comes the cautionary tale. Um, one night, this is, oh, ooh, like 15 years ago. No, it was 2010, 2010. We're, we're, we're um, doing a bunch of shows, and we did a show in New York City. And after the show, we all went to the hotel bar. And I will confess that I had too many vodka gimlets that night. Okay, I'm just getting that out right now. That's, that became the problem. And I was sitting between... Two of my favorite people in the band, uh, Roy Blunt Jr., who is one of the funniest people I've ever known, and Scott Turow, who's just brilliant and interesting guy. So I'm sitting between these two drinking vodka gimlets, and I'm trying to keep in t involved in both of their conversations. Roy is just a stream of funny stories, and Scott is telling this very detailed but kind of dramatic story about his spleen. <laughs> And, which had been removed, and, 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 but I'm trying to follow both, you know, and, and again, the gimlets, the gimlets were a problem. So I, I, I would keep interrupting Scott, and I'd say, wait a minute, I thought, I thought you, you don't have a spleen. And he'd go, I don't have a spleen, that's, but you know, the way he said it, I thought he did. And he said, I don't have a spleen, that's the point of the story, you know, and I'd, okay, and then I'd go back to Roy, and I'd, wait a minute, I thought, and I'd interrupt him again, and so if, he got tired of being interrupted by me, so he took a, a Sharpie, and rolled up my, my right arm sleeve and wrote on my forearm, no spleen. <laughs> in big letters, no spleen. So that solved the problem for the evening. And then, and then the night ends, we all go to bed. Um, not together, all went to separate bed. And, 
And then I woke up the next morning with like no memory of the night before, and I'm staggering toward the bathroom, and I look at the mirror, and I see there's something written on my arm, and I look down, and it says, no spleen. You know that urban legend of the salesman? He's at the hotel bar, an attractive woman slips a Mickey in his drink, and then he wakes up the next morning in the bathtub, packed in ice, with a note on his chest that said, we have harvested your kidney, right? And I'm thinking just for a moment there, oh my God, they harvested my spleen. But I don't even know where to look, you know? I, I still don't know where my spleen is. But then as my brain reboots, I think, Are you, that I'm being an idiot, you don't need a spleen. That was the whole point of Scott's story. You know, like, it's a useless organ, and probably in organ harvesting circles, there's an expression, he's so stupid he would harvest a spleen. You know, so. so if you've learned nothing else from me tonight, and I imagine you haven't, uh, don't go easy on the vodka gimlets. That's right. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you. Appreciate it. Also,